uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, what we do um, in our laboratory, in the stem cell laboratory at the School of Medicine. And in particular, I'm going to talk to you about how we can create personalized stem cells, stem cells that are specific to each and uh, each one of you. So uh, my name is Tamer Önder, and our lab is right across uh, the medical school. So in general, there are two types of stem cells. Um, there are those that are present in your body that are called tissue stem cells and those that are only present in a very short period of time during development when, you, when we are all embryos. So as you know, development starts when egg and sperm meets and forms this fertilized egg we also, that we also call the zygote. So this zygote divides, becomes two cell, eight cell, and then at uh, about three days or three to five days in the human, uh, forms this structure called, we call a blastocyst. So this is a hello structure that has some cells on the outside and some cells in the inside. And then th this little embryo implants into the uterine wall and forms a fetus, which then develops and becomes an adult person. Right? So in the adult, we have what are called adult tissue stem cells that are specific to each organ. So, for example, we have stem cells in our gut, in the intestines. So, if you take an electron, a uh, scan electron micro microscopy image, you'll see that our intestines are composed of these little villi that are made of cells which function to absorb nutrients from the food. But if you go closer, these villi actually look like fingers, and they're all covered in cells that are born at the bottom of these little fingers. And they're born because that's where the stem cells reside. So in this graph, you, sh you see the, the green uh, with a molecular biological technique. We have um, identified the stem cells as being at the bottom. And what's interesting about this is that uh, intestinal stem cells have to proliferate a lot because your entire lining of the intestine uh, gets renewed every seven days. So they have to generate a lot of cells. And if you lose your stem cells in the t intestines, you get uh, first of all diarrhea and then you die because of the dehydration. So in our, for in another example is our blood system. Our blood system is composed of many different cell types, you know, white blood cells, red blood cells, immune cells, but they all are derived from a single hematopoietic stem cell that actually is in your bone marrow. And if you lose hematopoietic stem cells, you get anemia and you die. So these are the tissue stem cells that we find in each different organ and they serve to replace and replenish the cells of that particular organ system. There is also another, I mentioned another type of stem cell, an embryonic stem cell. And that stem cell arises only at this stage when we are a blastocyst. And it forms the entire embryo. But if we take that blastocyst, that embryo, and put it in culture, we can actually derive cells that we can propagate in the laboratory that are called embryonic stem cells. And embryonic stem cells are very special kinds of stem cells because they, because they can make all kinds of other cell types. For example, I mentioned you the blood, cell, blood stem cell, that can only make a blood cell. But the embryonic stem cell can make all kinds of different cell types. So this blastocyst harbors very, really important cells. And it's a very, actually a small, uh, embryo at this stage, about 0.1 millimeters across. But again, if we take that embryo uh, and we put it in culture, if we dissociate the cells and put it in culture, we derive what are called embryonic stem cells that we can then sort of differentiate into different cell types. So we can make from embryonic stem cells neurons. We can make uh, heart muscles that are beating in the culture, or we can make retinal cells, um, any cell type that you can think about. The reason for this is these cells are very early cells that arise during development. So they are actually very useful for any kind of uh, therapies that we can think about that would use cell replacement. So what could that be? For example, you have a neurodegenerative disease uh, that might be cured by putting back in functional healthy neurons, where would you get those neurons? So one way to get those neurons would be to make them from embryonic stem cells. 
But there are, of course, problems with embryonic stem cells. And the reason for that is when you make an embryonic stem cell, you kill the embryo, right? So that embryo can no longer become a human being. So for a long time, people thought that it was unethical to take embryos and generate embryonic stem cells from those. And this was a problem because we couldn't make any of these cell types we wanted to make until 2006. So in 2006, a Japanese researcher called Shinya Yamanaka made a discovery which allowed us to generate embryonic stem cell-like cells without using embryos. So what he did was to take uh, some skin cells from mouse and then from any human and then add four genes into these skin cells. Deliver these four genes using certain viruses. And what these four genes do is that they reprogram, so they change the whole structure of the cell so that it becomes a stem cell. So this is a remarkable discovery because it, this beginning of the cell was a skin cell, it became a stem cell, and now it can again be differentiated into all the cell types that I mentioned to you. And for this discovery, he got the Nobel Prize in two, two years ago. So this allowed us to take a skin cell from any one of you and generate these special stem cells, which he called induced pluripotent stem cells or iPS cells. And of course, in this process, because we are using genes, we're not really destroying any embryos, right? And more importantly, the cells that we create, the stem cells that we create, are genetically identical to the starting material, which would be you or another patient. So if we were to ever transplant these differentiated cells back into you, there would be no immune rejection. They will be totally uh, compatible with each other. So where, where can we use these special type of iPS cells or induced pluripotent stem cells? There are many kinds of diseases where you can think about curing them by replacing a cell type that has been damaged. So these, these could be neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. For example, in Parkinson's disease, a portion of the brain loses dopaminergic neurons and we can actually make dopaminergic neurons in culture from these stem cells and perhaps transplant them back. Again, in many kinds of blood disorders, we might need to replenish the hematopoietic stem cell or the blood stem cell. And also in other types of diseases like diabetes or heart failure, myocardial infarction. In all these cases, we can think of uh, making stem cells, differentiating them into a sort of therapeutic cell and put them back into the patient. So how could this be in practice? For example, we might have, in the case of myocardial infarction, uh, so myocardial infarction is when uh, a portion of the heart muscle dies for, for some reason, and it no longer functions properly. It cannot pump the blood. So one way to uh, cure that or to uh, ameliorate that would be to add back in uh, heart muscle cells. So in that case, what we would do is take these skin cells that we call fibroblasts from the patient, uh, turn them into these iPS stem cells by using these four genes that Yamanaka found, and then differentiate these cells into cardiomyocytes, which are the muscle cells. And this is actually something that we can do in the lab right now. We can see that they grow as, they differentiate as patches of cells that contract on their own uh, because they're, that's their function. And we can think about uh, then placing these beating cells back into the heart where there's an injury. So this has actually, uh, is it possible uh, and is now being tried out in animal models. So here is an example uh, from uh, Japan. So what they have done is they have taken these, uh, they have made these cells from stem cells as sheets and they're going to implant them into a, um, a infected or damaged uh, well, it doesn't show, but what would you would see is that the, you would make these cell sheets in the laboratory and then um, make an excision in the heart and uh, suture these cell sheets in the, into the heart. So this would be uh, stem cells combined with what we call tissue engineering. So why are we, since there's so much potential in these personalized stem cells, why are we not seeing them in, used in the clinical 
care more often. So there are a number of challenges associated with making and using these cells for therapeutic purposes. One of them is, it takes a long time, when I take a skin cell from you, it takes a long time to make a, per a personalized stem cell, about four to six weeks. And if you have an acute condition, that's, that may not be uh, good for you. The other problem is that the efficiency of this conversion into a stem cellness is low. So if you start with about 100,000 cells, skin cells, you get about one to 10 stem cells. And remember, the way we do it, the way Yamanaka does it, or found to do it, was to deliver these four genes into the skin cells. And the way he delivered, and the way we delivered normally, is by using viruses. Because these genes are not normally expressed or um, available in skin cells, so we have to give them from outside. And there's a downside to using viruses in that they might cause mutations in the genomic material, which may lead to cancer. So in our lab, what we want to do is we want to understand how this process works. How does, when you put in these four genes into a skin cell, in a couple of weeks, how does that cell turn into a stem cell? So we are, we are molecular biologists, so we, we want to understand the mechanism of this. So if you look at this conversion going from a skin cell from a stem cell, when we look at what genes are different between these two cell populations, we see that many, many genes are different. So out of the 7,000 genes that were examined here, all of them show differential activity. So in, in the skin cells, there are 7,000 genes that are on or off that represent the need for the skin cell to function, like collagen, for example, is active in the skin cells. But then they're turned off and some other genes are turned on in the stem cells because stem cells need other genes to be active. And when we look carefully how, what regulates these gene expression differences, if you go look at more closely at the, at the genome, at our chromosomes, where the genes reside, we see that genes reside in the DNA, but actually they're wrapped around proteins that are called histones. And if you look at the structure of this um, interesting uh, uh, sort of unit, there is DNA around the core of proteins that are called histones, and these make up the small uh, subunits. And as you see, the, the proteins have these tails sticking out of, the, out of the DNA. So let's say our gene of interest is here. The, the, the structure of the histone dictates whether that gene is active or not. So if, if the histone proteins are modified in a sense, that might lead to them becoming compact so when they're compact, genes can no longer be activated, or they can be loosened, relaxed, and genes can be accessed. So there are a number of proteins, uh, enzymes, that modify these histone proteins and regulate gene activity. And uh, we have a, a number of them. So what we wanted to understand is because during the transition from a skin cell to a stem cell, many genes are turned on and off, we think that some of these proteins that regulate histones might be important for this process. So we tested that. Um, so here's, a, here's an experiment. So this experiment is taking skin cells and turning them into stem cells by using these four genes. And here we did not put any of the four genes. The plate is empty. And here we have put in the four genes. And we identified these colonies of stem cells by using a, 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 an antibody marker that uh, stains them dark like this. So there are about 100 colonies of stem cells on this plate, zero on this plate. So we wanted to ask which of the genes that we are interested in uh, regulate this process. Do they make it go ha faster? Do they make it more efficient or less efficient? So the way to do that would be to take each gene that you want to test singly and turn it off and ask whether this reprogramming or conversion into stem cell happens at a higher rate or at a lower rate. So we can quantify that. And this is one experiment that we did. We have asked among these 20 or something genes, which one of them, when we shut it down, make the stem cell conversion more efficient or less efficient. And you see that some 
they, they really, when we turn them off, they really inhibit the reprogramming. So these are important genes. And some, we actually get more reprogramming. So this is interesting. That means that we can uh, use these genes to make the process more efficient. And uh, one of my graduate students, Ayub, is now working on understanding how this gene, which is called SUV39H1, regulates this process. We have also found another gene called here DOT1L, which when we shut it down, makes much more uh, stem cells. So uh, we have used a small chemical inhibitor of this gene. Um, so this is our protein. This is where the inhibitor fits. And when we put this inhibitor into the experiment, Normally, we get about, again, 100 stem cell colonies. But at higher concentrations of this chemical, we get much more uh, stem cells. So this is a, an important finding. And we can also see that when we use the inhibitor of this enzyme, we can get colonies or stem cells by using only two of the genes that Yamanaka found. You know, I mentioned you, you that there were four genes that he found to be necessary for this conversion to stem cells. But if we put our inhibitor that we found, we can get colonies by just two of them. So this is also an important finding, because then we don't have to use the viruses to deliver these two genes that we can replace with this chemical. So DOT1L is a, the, the, um, the is a major interest in our laboratory. And um, uh, Eda, a postdoctoral researcher, and Denis and Duygu, um, graduate students, are working on understanding how DOT1L works. Uh, which other proteins DOT1L interacts with, and what could be additional functions of DOT1L. <laughs> so we also want to test other genes. So I showed you about a list of 22 genes. We have expanded this search to, inc to find new genes that are involved in this process. And uh, we found some that when we, again, turn off, we get more stem cells. And um, uh, Burju, a graduate student, and Mehmet, an undergrad, is working on one of these genes. So in the future, what we want to do is basically, when we want to create a personalized stem cells, we don't, we don't want to use these four original uh, factors that Yamanaka found that we have to deal with, with, with viruses. We want to use chemicals. The reason why, the reason is that uh, chemicals don't generally uh, cause mutations in our system, whereas viruses do. So I've shown you that we, can fi we found one such uh, chemical, the DOT1L inhibitor, that gets rid of two of them. So we hope that through our re uh, studies, we will be able to find other genes or compounds that, can, uh, that will allow us to reprogram the cells with no viruses. And then, of course, once we do that, we can differentiate the cells and uh, perhaps at one day uh, give them back to the per person. So another aspect of uh, this important stem cells is that we can use them to understand diseases. Uh, because when we take a small skin biopsy or skin cells from a patient, the resulting stem cells are identical genetically. So if the starting patient has a certain genetic or complex disease, the stem cells will still carry the characteristics of that disease. So we can have an unlimited source in the laboratory to study these, this disease. So instead of every time going to the patient and getting cells to, to understand the disease mechanisms, we can go to our stem cells and use those. And stem cells are immortal, so we can expand them uh, forever. So a number of, uh, for a lot of diseases, stem cell models have been created. So you might have heard of some of these, uh, for example, thalassemia or Alzheimer's disease. People have taken patient samples and turned them into stem cells. So we also are interested in doing that. One of the diseases that we are working on is a disease that's called familial Mediterranean fever. It's a very prevalent disease in Turkey. Uh, it's a genetic disease that affects the immune system, resulting in uh, an auto, uh, auto-inflammatory disorder. So uh, about 20% of Turkish population is a carrier, meaning that it's um, uh, among here, there's a quite a sizable. And if two carriers meet and have a child, they have about uh, one in fourth chance of uh, that the, the child having this disease. So this disease is caused by a single point mutation in that gene. So one uh, base pair to, to the DNA. And it's 
basically affects immune cells. So we wanted to uh, get patient samples from this disease, and we did, from both healthy controls and an FMF patient, took the, a little bit of a skin cells by uh, using a biopsy, and uh, derived these skin cells. And when we look at the, the DNA sequence, in fact, the patient has this mutation that I told you about. And then we converted these cells into the induced pluripotent stem cells by using the original method that Yamanaka did. And um, this is being carried out by a, a graduate student, a master's student, Kerem. And the reason we want to do that is, once we have the stem cells that are specific to this FMF disease, we can uh, study the molecular mechanism of the disease. Or if there are new drugs that affect this disease, we can test it on our stem cells. And we want to go one, actually one step further. Because this is a genetic disease, we actually have the means to go in into the genome of the, the diseased cells and correct the mutation. So remember, I, I told you that this disease is caused by a single base pair change in the DNA. So now we have available techniques that allow us to go and uh, correct this one single base pair change to its original form. So uh, resulting in healthy cells. And this is uh, being done by another master since Gunnar. So again, I told you two different uh, aspects of our research. One is to understand the mechanism of making personalized stem cells. The other aspect is about application of these stem cells to particular disease situations. And this is our, um, this is our group, uh, and these are our collaborators and funding. And thank you. So I'll, I'll leave you with this picture. So this is a painting from about around in the Renaissance painting from Germany. So it's called the Fountain of Youth. Uh, the reason why I'm showing you is that in the news, stem cells are always thought to be uh, like a fountain of youth. Here you see old and uh, like decrepit people coming in, bathing, and then they emerge very rejuvenated, young and happy. Um, so we hope that stem cells offer this promise, although not fully realized yet, it will be. Thank you.